Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We are deviating for a couple of weeks from Deuteronomy for the Christmas season. And uh, today we're looking at Hebrews, two different verses, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 and also chapter 2 verse 14. So have your your finger holding place on both of those. Be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. It is inerrant. It has no errors of any kind and it is fully authoritative for all matters of faith and practice. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power in chapter 2 verse 14 we read this since therefore the children share in flesh and blood he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we bless you this morning. We honor your Son, as your word says that whoever does not honor your Son does not honor you. And so we pray that you would bless us now with the Holy Spirit that he would illuminate your word that is about your son, that as we listen to these things and as we consider deep and mysterious things about your son's divine nature and human nature, that this was all for us and for our salvation. So help us to worship you now, first in our attentive listening, And may we be convicted where we need to about shallow thoughts about you and perhaps a dead and dry spirit as our hearts fail in many ways to worship you, to adore your son and his majesty. Help us now to do that. Use my words to do that. Guard my lips from error and guard and guide our attention span and our affections as we Seek to pay attention and to understand this truth about your Son. We pray that you would be honored in it. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title this morning is The Radiance of the Glory of God Shared in Flesh and Blood. And so we're taking the two truths of those two passages about his divine nature and his human nature. The radiance of the glory of God shared in flesh and blood. I can remember three, more than three years ago now in the spring of 2006 as uh, us Marinos were packing up and heading to Florida for RTS and about those same weeks uh, Ligonier Ministry was coming out with its statement on Christology. That just means doctrine of Christ. It's called the Word Made Flesh and I remember thinking to myself at that time when it came out, you know, really do we need a Uh, a creed or a statement of faith on the doctrine of Christ. We are very, very shallow as evangelicals in our doctrine. I understand that, but surely the doctrine of Christ, that's the one thing that I won't say we've got that down, but surely it's the one thing that that we all have in common. Um, We have the biblical Jesus, not like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or, and I had in my mind all these groups that have these extreme errors of Jesus. We've answered, we've at least got the question right that Jesus asked in Matthew 16, 15, who do you say that I am? As I step back from that picture a little bit, and it's not just an Idaho thing, as we contrast ourselves with Mormons, it's really an American thing. I, I think we we take for granted a historic doctrine of Christ that actually we don't know a whole lot about. 
We've barely scratched the surface of it. I think as I was reading some of the classic works of theology over the past few years, it occurred to me that even if you could just take at random a handful of early church fathers, and I think if you sat them down in the average small group study in American Christianity and let them talk for a second, we would probably all poke each other and say, is he a heretic? Is that a heresy? But actually, we would be the heretics. And so extreme denials of the divinity of Christ out there, I think, can blind us to the very shallow understanding that we often have of the Son of God. We tend to have a very low bar when it comes to thinking about the second person of the Trinity. And so the two points today, and I will say this, we are going to the deep end of the pool today. Um, But as we're going to see at the end, that is, I think, one of the best Christmas presents we can give to each other. We're going to look here today at these two texts, Hebrews 1.3 and 2.14, but really we're going to use them as a springboard for these two doctrinal points. And I'm going to borrow, for just a little bit of help, the language of the Belgic Confession in Articles 10 and 18. I'm going to use the language in those two sections to help understand what these two passages in Hebrews 1 and 2 are saying. So our two points today that we're going to see is first, Jesus Christ is true and eternal God. That's the first point. Secondly, Jesus Christ is the incarnate word. So divine nature, human nature. And the big idea is just the same as the title. The radiance of the glory of God shared in flesh and blood. And my hope is today to present a picture of the Son of God that in a sense needs little application. Millions of applications. But sometimes it is good to simply stare into the mystery of what the scriptures are presenting to us and be challenged in our understanding and in our worship. So first let's look at Jesus Christ being the true and eternal God. The language of the Belgic Confession helps us Especially, it's almost like they're unpacking Hebrews 1.3. It says, we believe that Jesus Christ, according to his divine nature, is the only begotten Son of God, begotten from eternity. And this is an example of why I'm choosing to do this. That last part especially, begotten from eternity. We saw last Sunday, one of the clearest expressions in the New Testament of the deity of Christ in Titus 2.13, that he is called our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, here in Hebrews 1.3, we have another clear statement of the divinity of Christ, because here the inspired author calls him the radiance of the glory of God. Very clear that that is calling him God, radiance. Radiance here does not mean a light that is reflected, like the light of the sun coming off the moon, but that which radiates from. As another creed, the Nicene Creed, put it, he is light from light. And the very first thing we have to challenge ourselves with and get out of our mind is that that is a reflection or a second thing happening like we experience things in this world. This is a very crucial expression in the creed, because we often struggle to get our minds wrapped around the idea of the divine Son being eternally begotten. See, even if you didn't use language like that in the creeds, you'd be stuck with the language in the text, that he's the radiance, or as it goes on to say, the image. If you just stop for a second, instead of just, you know, kind of checking your boxes of your Bible reading each day, that already is incredibly mysterious. The radiance that he radiates in some way, from the Father. We have to get our minds at least a little bit wrapped around that because it's in the text. And what this radiance or this light from light is all about is like, here's one imagery, a sun giving off its light. But unlike a finite star in our universe, this light, this sun, does not dissipate. It doesn't diffuse. It doesn't run out of energy or borrow its energy. There is no separation between father and son of sequence 
or entropy, a loss of that energy. There is no, in that sense, first and second, since what is two between father and son, what is proper to the persons, is one in divine essence. And so the divine son is not when we say that he is the radiance of the glory of God. We are not saying that he is caused, that there was a time or a point where he was not. And we'll look at that in just a second. This radiance of Hebrews 1.3 is the radiance of divine glory. It is an eternal radiance. And so when you're thinking about that imagery of that light coming from that sun, say, well, that started. Yes, that did in this universe. The faint analogy is like that. But the real thing is an eternal radiance, which means that this radiance is every attribute of God. It is immutable. It never changes. Can't. It is infinite. It is eternal. It has no sequence of time. And all the other attributes of God. And that brings us to the next words in the Belgic Confession that are very helpful here, that he was not made nor created. For then he should be a creature. But he is co-essential. In other words, same essence, and co-eternal with the Father. Now, what are they warring against there? Well, the menacing heresy in the early centuries of the church, in the fourth century, that made that Council of Nicaea so necessary was the error of someone named Arius of Alexandria. And by the way, if you're, you ever see one of these memes, the one thing we probably do know about St. Nicholas was that he punched Arius in the face. For being a hero. Actually, we don't know that either. That's a legend. But that he was there and he actually fought Arius physically um, over that doctrine. Well, I don't know about that. But Arius is famous for saying this that there was when he was not. In other words, there was a time, there was a point, there was some state of existence in which the sun was not. In other words, Arianism taught that the sun was, well, he's the most like God. He's the most godlike of all, and they look at Colossians 1.15. Aha, he's the firstborn of all creation. And we can talk about what that means and does not mean. But they say he is like God, homoousian, like in nature or substance, but not the same as God, homoousian. By the way, one of the most famous criticisms of Christian theology ever was uh, Edward Gibbon, his rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And one of the things he said is that you guys fought over one little iota. Have you ever heard that expression, one little iota? That's where it comes from. And, there, and what he's doing is, you see what happened? Islam came in and all these things happened in the history of the West after because you guys couldn't stop fighting over one little I. Well, that one little I is the difference between one with God and like God. Two totally different religions. Two totally different worldviews come from that. And the same early church fathers who used the language of the eternal generation of the Son also used the language of him being consubstantial with the Father, co-essential, one with. And they didn't see any contradiction between saying that he is one with the Father in every way and yet the radiance of the Father, begotten, eternally begotten of the Father. And we'll come back to that concept and what's the difference between that and his human birth and stuff like that. And so here in Hebrews, the author does not merely use the imagery of a radiance, but he adds language to it, that this son is the exact imprint of his nature. So if you ever say, those crazy theologians, why did they see no contradiction? The author of Hebrews doesn't either. He says on the one hand that he is radiating from the Father in some sense. And at the same time, he is one with him in nature. Another early church father, Ambrose, who taught Augustine a lot of stuff. He makes an argument from Isaiah 43.10. That the father and the son, if you're going to say the son is divine, you cannot say that he's inferior to the father. And he argues from Isaiah 43.10, which says this. Before me, there was no other God, and there shall be none after me. And so Ambrose says from that, well, who is it that says this? 
the Father or the Son? If it's the Son, he says, before me, there was no other God. If the Father, he says, after me, there shall be none. The one has none before him, the other none after him. The punchline is this. You can't call Jesus divine in any meaningful sense and make him inferior or caused by the Father. That's incredibly important. You can't simply say that you worship Jesus. Jesus accepts worship of Thomas in John 20, uh, John in Revelation. Jesus, God commands all the angels to worship him in Hebrews 1. You can't do that unless Jesus is one with God. Paul speaks of the divine essence of Jesus as the fullness of deity in Colossians 2.9. And elsewhere, in Romans 9, that Christ is God over all. You think of Romans 9 and how controversial it is about predestination, and we forget that in verse 5 of that chapter, Christ is God over all. That's pretty clear. If you're young and you run into a college professor or one of your friends or coworkers in just a short time that says, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, or the disciples didn't, and the Bible never says, they are bearing witness that they have never read the Bible seriously. The Bible is crystal clear that Jesus is God. Three other places make it clear that Jesus is, together with the Father, the creator of all things. John 1.3, 1 Corinthians 8.6, and Colossians 1.16 and 17. Jesus Christ created everything. He was there in it with the Father. Proverbs 8, the same thing that he was daily my delight. That's wisdom talking personified. It's Jesus Christ, the word of the Father, that is creating everything. And here in Hebrews 1.3, the same creative power of Christ extends from the original creation to the constant maintaining of everything that is not God. So do remember that if you ever fall asleep during a sermon, that Jesus Christ is intentionally holding all your molecules together and speaking you into existence. And at any point, if he wanted to cease speaking you into existence, you would cease to exist. I'm not just picking on you if you fell asleep at a sermon, but do remember that at all times in your life when you're tempted to sin or when you're worshiping him. This is what physicists are finally figuring out, took them long enough, that at the subatomic level, there's nothing there. There's an infinite regress of things between points unless there is some eternal cause speaking it into existence. And that's what Hebrews 1.3 ascribes to Jesus, that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And it's no coincidence that Jesus is called the Logos or the word in John 1. The Belgian Confession, one more expression I want to borrow here is that he is the express image of his person. And they're pulling this right from this passage. And the brightness of his glory, equal unto him in all things. So before explaining the meaning of the Son as the image of the Father, let me bring in a few verses uh, that use similar language. Colossians 1.15 calls Christ the image of the invisible God. And we Christians, when we think about ourselves being made into a new man or a new woman, how does, the, how does Paul talk about this? And Colossians 3.10 says that our new man or our new woman, our new humanity in other words, is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I mentioned last Sunday night about the assembly line in Adam, that he became a sin factory, and nothing came off that line except for sin, and more children who became sin factories, and nothing came off their line except for more sin and more sin factories. Well, now Jesus Christ has put the building under new ownership, and in Colossians 1.15, he is called the prototakos, the firstborn. And we get the English word prototype from words like proto and first. And so Jesus Christ, uh, Romans 8.29, says that we are being conformed into his image. And the way that Paul constantly talks about that is that the way that happens, Romans 12.2 and 2 Corinthians 318 is that by beholding that same image, we start to be shaped into his likeness and into his image. And so actually, this is incredibly 
practical. The word for image in the New Testament, icon, is our source for the English word icon. But that can be misleading. As we've saw, seen in Deuteronomy, that's not good when we fashion things as if they are God. God alone has the prerogative to do that. And so what makes the Son an image in this eternal sense is not something that makes him at all. When we say that Christ is the image of the Father, we're not talking about anything visible, nor are we talking about anything that is fashioned as having boundaries. Again, don't yet jump to his humanity. We're talking about the Son of God in his divine essence. And so it has no boundaries to his form. This image fashions us, but he himself is unfashioned. How can he be an image then? We think of our own reflection in the mirror, for example. The two are not equal, our face and the reflection. But the face comes before the reflection. And so when we look at all these passages and find out that the theologians weren't just, they just have too much time on their hands, this is the way the scriptures themselves talk about it, as if Jesus is generating from the Father, eternally. But when we think of that, we think of a mirror, Face, reflection, my face came first. You can put an infinity of mirrors there, and at some point, the whole thing needs to be explained by there being a face. There has to be some one. There has to be some first, and so this trips us up. Great Christian theologians like Augustine and Jonathan Edwards put a lot of thought into this idea of the Son being the image of the Father. And as as you think about these images that they came up with and and words that, that fall short, Think of the fact that Christ is called the Word, that he is called the wisdom of God. He is God's thought. He is God's reflection upon himself. He is image. He is idea. All of these attributes are are spoken of, of the Son of God eternally. And so Augustine starts coming up with all these illustrations of the Trinity, and he knows that, that they fall short. They're not meant to be analogies, like in the human soul, there's mind, knowledge, and love. And by the way, this is a bit better than like, oh, it's, it's like an egg, or like a, or a clover, or, you know, some, or fire, or sorry, uh, ice, uh, steam, and, and water. And we come up with these analogies, and you, you know what's wrong with them. All of them are pretty much a heresy. And Augustine knew that, and, and he's looking at uh, memory and understanding and will. And he's just trying to get us to think more invisibly, like God is. But if you take any of these as analogies and take them too seriously as the way it is, they would lead to heresies like modalism, that the Father, Son, and Spirit, those are just modes of his being. And so in the Old Testament, he was the Father, and then in the New Testament, he becomes Jesus, and at Pentecost, he becomes the Holy Spirit. That's a heresy. That's called modalism. And so you have to be careful in your analogies of this. But what Augustine landed on was something that was repeated by other theologians, And Jonathan Edwards, in a very profound, uh, unpublished essay on the Trinity, I'll give you just one little sliver of it. And he has in mind Hebrews 1, 3. So Edwards says this. And remember, he's answering the question, what do you mean eternally generated? So Edwards says, Therefore, as God, with perfect clearness, fullness, and strength, understands himself, views his own essence, in which there is no distinction of substance versus act, but which is holy substance and holy act. That idea which God has of himself is absolutely himself. This representation of the divine nature and essence is the divine nature and essence again. So that by God's thinking of the deity, must certainly be generated. Hereby there is another person begotten. There is another infinite, eternal, almighty, and most holy, and the same, the moment your mind starts to say, wait a minute, that means another, Edward says, and the same God, the very same divine attributes. And every single one of those turns of phrases he justifies with scripture. And so lest we get the idea that these thinkers were just speculating They offer scriptures that agree with this view of divine radiance, that Jesus was this word or 
perfect thought or reflection of the Father from all eternity, never starting and stopping again, just perfectly always happening. Christ is called in 2 Corinthians 4.4, the image of God in the gospel. And, and the radiance, the illuminated image of God. He's called the word of God in John 1.1. 1, 1. I mentioned this before, the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24. That's, I hope we don't read those verses and just kind of, you know, that's like a rah-rah thing. So we sort of collect those words, but they don't mean anything. No, they mean exactly what they mean. Christ is the word of God. He is the wisdom of God. This divine imaging is a communion in the Trinity. It's a perfect fellowship that God always had in himself. But for us, it's the fountain of all his communication with us. He is a speaking God. It's his very nature. John 1.18 says that no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And again, it doesn't mean that the Son is actually by the Father's side, physically, in that sense, in his divine nature. He means that perfect reflection of the Father is explaining the Father. What practical reason this matters is that even though everything in the world is some kind of a revelation of God, think Psalm 19, 1 through 3, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies above proclaim his handiwork. So, Everything in the world is an icon or an image of God in some sense, in some faint way. But he's made human beings even more of an image. But human beings are broken images. Christ is the perfect revelation of God. John 14, 9. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The exact image. The exact radiation. From the Father. All else that is called an image is really just an analogy. Each of them has some sameness, but the word has exactness. Now keep this in mind when you're conversing with Muslim neighbors. Because they really get tripped up on the idea of generation. They immediately focus, as a lot of us do, so we can't help them, on the physical and so when they hear, and by the way, they butcher the Trinity in the Quran, you would think if it was a perfect book, they would at least get the doctrine right that they're criticizing. They believe that the Father, Son, and Mary are the Trinity. Did you know that? I didn't either until last year. I looked into it more, read more of the Quran. They don't even know the doctrine. This is bad if your book is supposedly inspired. Okay, at least know what you're criticizing. But why do they do that? It's because they're so fixated that this must have been an earthly relationship that God had with Mary. And that's what they have in their minds. This eternal generation is not a physical generation. Physical generation is the copy of the eternal reality. And so it was fitting that the Son of God became incarnate. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all uh, involved in the incarnation, but only the Son became incarnate. So we move on to our second point. The second point is that Jesus Christ is the incarnate word. So we see that he's God, but now that we're going to see he's an incar the incarnate word. By the way, it's even better when you're doing deep theology to have a car horn going off. <laughs> it just makes it, it's just like a hurdle, you know, like cones and flares. Just, it just increases the difficulty level. So uh, you get more points if you listen. All right. So uh, they hear me. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ is the incarnate word. So let's go back to the Belgic Confession because it's going to help us understand Hebrews 2 now. It says, He who took upon him the form of a servant and became like unto man, really assuming the true human nature with all its infirmities, sin accepted. So that's that verse, like in every way except for sin. He never sinned. Okay, so that's important. But this language comes from Paul, who says about Christ in Philippians 2, 7, that he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Let's rule out how not to think about that. Liberal theologians in the 19th century 
seized on that phrase, emptied himself, kenosis in the Greek. And they said, that's, that's like, oh, that's like he, he poured out his divinity. He became less, and we, it's a natural mistake to make. So when he came down here, like 50% or 0% not God, or the sun was just like, the sun left heaven. No, none of that. The divine nature cannot change. The divine nature cannot suffer any defect. This reference of Jesus emptying himself is not a reference properly to his divine nature, but it's a manner of speaking about his human nature, that he took on a servant form. It's a manner of speaking. He became, one translation says, as nothing. He didn't become nothing in becoming something, so you know it's a manner of speaking. He became lowly. He took on a humble role. And so that nature is assumed and united to his divine person and nature. This act of emptying himself means that, and Paul uses it to, to tell us, have that same mind among yourself. But another way that Paul says this is in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, that Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. So everything we're talking about today, Oh, it's mysterious. If it's true, you become rich with a richness that's above anything in this world. So immediately practical right there. But why mention these lowly things? And not just, why isn't it enough that he just takes on a human form, a servant form? That's bad enough. But it says the infirmities of the body. It's because our bodies have infirmities. God makes the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering, and we'll look at Hebrews 2.10 again in a second. But Christ's suffering, he had to suffer for our sake. The, the passion of Christ, as it's referred to, his suffering, not simply only the cross, though that is the preeminent way that he suffered, but his whole life, as was mentioned before, even him subjecting himself to the Pharisees, wagging their fingers at him about the law when he wrote that law. And he... And he Put himself under that. Christ's suffering is a perfecting agent. That's what Hebrews 2.10 is saying. Make the founder of, make us perfect by suffering. Well, that's true, but that's not what it says. First, it makes the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. What is meant by that? Because Jesus has no defect. In fact, even his human nature, it specifically says without sin. What do you mean by perfecting the son? Well, a clue is in passages like when he learned <coughs> obedience. Uh, even in his childhood, Luke 2.14 talks about this, that he grew in wisdom and stature and so on. So again, this perfection is like that prototype, that he was put through a fire. And as Adam failed, Christ succeeded in every way, except better, because when Adam was in paradise being tempted, he was in paradise when Jesus was tempted, he was in the wilderness. When Adam was tempted, he had a companion. When Jesus was tempted, he was abandoned. And yet Adam failed, and Jesus passed through the fire. And so perfected there means something more like a product being subjected to rigorous tests. And so that's the first thing that's happening. But the second thing is that then that becomes a legal ground whereupon God could work on us and make us holy. Because as it is, his eyes are too pure to look upon our sin. And so we need to be justified and sanctified. And so we need to be perfected by that perfect man. This miracle that we celebrate every year is described in this way in the confession. It says, being conceived in the womb of the blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost, without the means of man. Now, I've heard this struggle before, and, and now that I've heard about it, I, I thought, well, I should bring this up because I bet other people are struggling with it. Somebody said to me this week, wouldn't the virgin birth make him not fully human? And you're, why, why is that? What are they struggling with? Well, he wouldn't have the full set of chromosomes, and thus not fully human DNA. And I'm not. You know, I wasn't making fun of the person at all in any sense. It seems like a natural enough misunderstanding. But just step back just for a moment and consider the first man, Adam. If we're worried about Jesus not having a human biological father, 
it should be remembered that Adam had neither father nor mother, biologically speaking. Furthermore, Adam was created full grown. And so hopefully we're starting to get a sense of how oftentimes when we stumble over individual miracles, it's an exercise in special pleading. We're just forgetting about the power of God. And I don't mean that in any kind of God of the gaps way. Well, just God did it. It doesn't have to make sense. No, it makes sense too. The real question you see is how any human being could have DNA without divine causality. Because that's what it is at the end of the day. It's more logos. It's more word. It's more information. The fact that the norm for passing that down is hereditary and the miracle encodes that information all at once is utterly besides the point. God didn't need Joseph's help at all, including at the DNA level. So I understand the, uh, at first uh, the misunderstanding, but it's not a problem at all. The Belgic Confession continues that he did not only assume a human nature as to the body, but also a true human soul, that he might be a real Man, And this is going to take us the rest of the way because what I want to press here is that if these things are not true about his human nature, just like his divine nature, we could not be saved by him. And so if you're ever struggling with this, the big words or whatever else, and you think, so you're saying that if I haven't thought about this yet, I wasn't a real Christian? No, we're not saying that. What we are saying is that if this, if this didn't happen this way, you wouldn't be a real Christian, neither would I or anybody else. We could not be saved if this were not so. And that's the exact logical language that Hebrews 2 presses. Even the word flesh in John 1.14 comprehends both body and soul. And so the early church fathers had a language, they had a maxim, a saying, for this necessity of the full human assumption. They said this, what was not assumed could not be redeemed. And here's what they meant by that. If Jesus didn't have a mind or a will or a body or face temptations, if he did not have what is basic now, what is essential to human nature, then that part of human nature could not be redeemed. And that's what they were getting at. In other words, if God was going to restore the whole image, then Christ had to redeem the whole image. But if Christ was going to redeem the whole image, then he had to be that whole image. This immediately should change our minds about bodies and minds and emotions. How many have you struggled with any of those things being dirty? Well, we got it dirty in the fall, but that's human sin. God made all of those beautiful for his own glory. So let's take this one step further. Why did Jesus have to become the whole image to redeem it and so forth? Here's the logic of it in the fall. The whole image had fallen. The whole image had failed God's glory. We, in our whole beings, fail God's glory every day. Our minds fail to think about God. Our emotions fail to be all for God, that passion. Our decisions Choose anything but God all the time. Our bodies are then sold out to the passing pleasures of this world in every way imaginable. Our whole beings lied about the worth of God. And so redemption requires that the mediator, the savior, be a real man, a full man. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 gives us this logic. Paul says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. And so the logic is simply this. Somebody with a body had to tell the truth about the body. Somebody with a heart had to have their whole heart in on it. Some mind had to pay mind only to God. Some will had to will away back to God. 
every part of humanity had to give to God that which we owed God. You say, I know that. He had to pay the penalty on the cross, and that's true. But before that, if God had paid every single debt on the cross and we had been forgiven of every sin, we would still owe God positive righteousness. We would owe him honor in our mind and in our body. And so Jesus' life of obedience, Romans 8, uh, 5, 18 and 19 says, his act makes the many to be counted righteous. Even after the resurrection, Jesus drew attention to the earthiness of his body. When the disciples were afraid that he was a ghost, what did he say in Luke 24, 39? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. This is after the resurrection. He wasn't a ghost. The resurrection wasn't merely spiritual. That glorified body that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 40 is after all a body. In the incarnation, God tells us what he thinks about physical nature and his creation. He didn't make a mistake. He's not taking it back. In fact, he's making it better than the original. Note the rationale for this full humanity. Last part from the Belgian Confession, it says, for since the soul was lost as well as the body, it was necessary that he should take both upon him to save both. This concept of necessity, that it was necessary, specifically about the humanity of Jesus, is used by the author of Hebrews repeatedly. A word parallel to that is the word fitting in Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So I read that verse before, but now that first part is it was fitting. And why is that? Well, verses 14 that we started with all the way through verse 18 in Hebrews 2 is crucial. Listen to all the logic words. Because, therefore, since, in order that, so that, and so forth. The logic of incarnation for salvation. Humanity for salvation. He took on flesh, meaning his, the soul, too. He took on these things for our salvation. So here it is, Hebrews 2, starting at verse 14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. It's like in five different ways the author of Hebrews is saying, isn't it great that Jesus became a full man? Because that's the only way that you're going to have eternal life as a full, perfected human being. The necessity of the incarnation for salvation was a cardinal point of controversy in the Middle Ages. A lot of people started to speculate that Christ would have come in the flesh even if man had never sinned. It became sort of a speculative thing. But there's a few uh, reasons to reject that speculation. And the first one is that it is indeed speculation. Because Scripture nowhere offers any other reason but that one would come who would crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3.15. And that he would save his people from their sins in Matthew 1.21. And this salvation, Titus 1.2 says, God had promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word. And so the first part of that, God planned the whole gospel from eternity past. Before the worlds began, no reason to speculate. The incarnation makes the sense that it does because he is redeeming your total person and the whole world. Everything that God created good, he's making better. He's not just going to rewind to Adam in the garden. He's going to perfect it. And all of that because of Christ. 
let's apply this to two different areas of our life. I know, and, and this is going to be feel less like application and more like more doctrine. But, um, but we're going to apply it to different other things that we're thinking of, including worship, and we'll, we'll end on that. But first of all, let's avoid two other equal and opposite mistakes. There are a lot of mistakes, a lot of heresies that have happened in the history of the church. And I think sometimes what comes later can mirror the way that our mind can, can go. After the Council of Nicaea, when they, when they said, no, Jesus Christ is uncreated. He is one with the Father. And so you might hear that and say, amen, okay, I'll be a good Christian now. But then you might hear that in two different wrong ways. And that's what happened in the next century. So there had to be another council because there were two errors that came out called Nestorianism and monophysitism. Don't worry, they won't be on the test. You don't need to know the names, but we do need to know what these mistakes are because I hear them all the time. The one is named after Nestorius, who might actually not have been guilty of the heresy itself, but the idea is this. The idea of Nestorianism is to so press the two distinct dimensions of the son's existence once you factor in the incarnation. And you want to distinguish those two natures. Yeah, two natures. But to so press it that you actually affirm two persons. One divine person, the Lagos, and the other a separate human person. And this is a lot of liberal thought. And a lot of stuff that I see in evangelical bookstores everywhere, sort of a neo-Nestorianism that will say that Jesus was just, he was the most in tuned to God human being, regular human being. And that's what you wind up with, with this idea that separates these as two persons. Now, the reaction to that out of Alexandria started out very orthodox in the unity of Christ, that there's one, but one of the followers of this group, a guy named Eutychus, sought unity to the Son by sort of blending those two natures together. No, Jesus is one person sort of stirring it up in the pot, sort of an amalgamation. Even Lewis used the word amalgamation in mere Christianity. Wrong, not a good word, because you're, you're suggesting this mixture. And that became known as monophysitism, mono meaning one, and physis being the word for nature. And what you wind up with after is neither, and you wind up getting a third nature. But that's a heresy as well. Charles Hodge in the 19th century explains the problem with either one of these extremes. Hodge says that Christ's person is theanthropic, God-man. He's the God-man in his person. Not in his nature, singular nature. It's two natures united to one person. Hodge says, because that would make the finite infinite and the infinite finite. Christ would be neither God nor man, but the scriptures constantly declare him to be both God and man. And so the Council of Chalcedon in that fifth century more fully articulated what became known as the hypostatic union. Now you start using words like this and the response from many people is, including a lot of theologians, so-called, I'll put air quotes around it because they lose their credential as theologians if they yawn at this or if they say, who cares? What a bunch of nitpicky stuff. Mark Jones explains why this matters for our very salvation. He says, after all, if Jesus were in all things only a man, he would be at an infinite distance from God just as we are. In the same way, if Jesus were in all things only God, he would be at an infinite distance from us. As the mediator, however, he bridges the gap between the infinite God and finite man. And in our final application, worship. We've only scratched the surface of the mystery of the second person of the Trinity who became like us. Just analyzing those words, if I only said it once, no matter which words I chose, no matter which authorities I cited, whatever combination of scripture verses I used, or what illustrations would have worked better than the illustrations I used, we would have only scratched the surface. If we were to stay here for another two hours, which we won't, or for two more lifetimes, we would have only scratched the surface. 
And so let me challenge you to make your very first New Year's resolution to immediately set aside time and probably about 20 bucks or so to read one substantive work on the doctrine of Christ in the next year. At least one on the person of Christ, whether that be R.C. Sproul's book, The Glory of Christ, or the more recent excellent book that I've mentioned, Mark Jones's book, Knowing Christ, or pick a classic if you're feeling brave, John Owen's Glory of Christ. But whatever you pick, and grab a pastor and pick the right book, uh, we'll help you with that. Make it your business. Like, for example, Jesus Calling, don't, no. A, he's not, and he's not telling you to get that book, so grab a pastor, we'll help you find a good book. But make it your business, and make it a matter of devotion and worship, to think deeply about this radiance of the glory of God sharing in flesh and blood. Because if you do, you will have only scratched the surface. But go there, because there is what your soul was made for. As we sing songs and we hear songs at Christmas time like, Oh, come let us adore him. Does it ever occur to us? Do we ever stop and check our hypocrisy at the door for a second and say, Wait a minute. Do I mean it? What does that even mean? You see, the trouble that we often have with worshiping the Son of God is obvious. It's that our theology is not deep enough to inspire adoration in the first place. And so perhaps we might consider giving each other this Christmas the gift of a deeper doctrine of Christ. I'll end with the words of the Puritan Stephen Charnock, who scratches the surface of adoration in saying this, What a wonder, what a wonder that two natures infinitely distant should be more intimately united than anything in the world. That the same person should have both a glory and a grief, an infinite joy in the deity and an inexpressible sorrow in the humanity, that a God upon a throne should be an infant in a cradle, the thundering creator be a weeping babe and a suffering man. The incarnation astonishes men upon earth and angels in heaven. So let it astonish you by going deep. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we cannot even scratch the surface of the mystery, of the radiance of the glory of God who shared in flesh and blood. We pray that you would inspire us now to begin that, if we need to begin and to go deeper as we all do that we would want to mean the words that have been so carefully crafted by those who have reflected upon this mystery, that we would never lose the wonder of this mystery, that we would also not shrink back from its harder dimensions so long as they are guarded by the words in your scriptures. We thank you for these things, and we pray that you would do this work on our hearts, that we would adore your Son. In Jesus' name. Amen.